Suzanne Jewell is a dear friend and mentor of mine. Um, she's going to talk today about three um, specific tactics that you can use to make yourself a better marketer through mindful practices. One is the anti-anxiety breath, and you're actually going to get a handout uh, and a recording of the anti-anxiety breath so that you can use this tool at any point during your busy and crazy workday. She's going to talk about the pause, breathe, um, the pause, breathe, smile practice, the PBS practice, and she's going to talk about how to use empathy to be the customer, an essential tool not only of mindfulness but also of marketing. Now, Suzanne is a marketer, and she is someone who came to mindfulness, as she may tell you, through her own life story. But she's been she's one of the top people worldwide in helping connect marketing and communications with mindfulness. So this session is very much a session about marketing. And she really understands how to connect business imperatives and the language of businesses to the marketing space and uh, to the mindfulness space. She's a former global TV executive and she's now a social entrepreneur. She runs the Mindful Entrepreneur, which is a, a marketing strategy and consultancy. She has some incredible clients, including the Gates Foundation, DirecTV, AOL, as well as the Miami-Dade College um, and Babson's Win Lab. And she's the founder of a podcast called, called Mindful Mornings Miami. So she's really uh, a broadcast uh, in her past and a broadcaster today, sort of like me, somebody who has really um, transitioned her, her broadcast skills uh, into the service of training and teaching others. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Suzanne Jewell. Suzanne, welcome and thank you for doing this. I want to say welcome to uh, all of you who are here. Bienvenidos. I think we have Argentina in the house. I think we've got Brazil in the house. We've got literally, you know, look at all these global faces. And Dan, what a delight that after we first met, um, I actually was probably one of the first people to, to track Dan down with some of his advertising he was doing. And I actually made a call to him and it was this interesting connection we had. And as he shared, um, television and communications on the global level really is the soup from which I was first originally birthed. Um, I am a born, bred, and raised girl from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where my dad used to be the mayor. I then spent some time getting my undergrad degree in Sevilla, in la Facultad de Letras, en donde se habló español perfectamente bien. So, bienvenidos to everyone who is here for that. And I was moved to Miami, and it'll uh, show both my roots and my age, it was a couple of decades ago, to work with the Cisneros family out of Venezuela. And I literally helped them launch in the entire Latin American continent, everything from DirecTV to AOL to Comedy Central to Playboy TV to several other brands. And I myself ended up deciding to get out of that particular world, became an entrepreneur in my strategic marketing and communications business. And during that, while I was living in Miami and working in Ethiopia, and my mother was in Michigan passing away of stage 4B cancer, I myself experienced what I guess you could call a really interesting wake up from the universe that was about a two by four upside my head, and it was panic attacks. And the reason I'm going to share it with you is because I'm going to step aside and show you someone that all of you may know of, but you may not know that he's the same individual who experienced this as well. He too is from the broadcast media industry. His name is Dan Harris. He's an on-air national news anchor. He had a panic attack on air. And it was a very unlikely meditator that came to the practice of mindfulness. And I'm going to first give you what his animated video is about what actually is this thing that if you walk through the line at the grocery store, and hopefully you have six feet between you and everyone around you, you see on the front of Time magazine that says mindful this and mindful that. I'm going to also throw to you a little bit of data that this last three weeks on LinkedIn, according to the CEO, the most downloaded and watched content on LinkedIn has been all about mindfulness, attention training, and resilience practices. What I happen to call bounce back ability. 
And for any of you who are old enough to remember the toy called Weebles, they were like a little egg. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen with you. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. So I'm gonna give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? you immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction. With just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you, rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in, they showed that physical exercise is really good for you, and now all of us do it, and if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's gonna join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying, mindfulness is not gonna solve all of your problems. It's not gonna render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. And yeah. what we're going to do right now is we're actually going to practice. I'd love to see by a show of hands. How many of you have actually done any form of meditation? If you can throw up your hand. So we've got quite a few of you. Awesome. Awesome. So what I'm going to invite you to do first and foremost right now is take what is called a dignified seat. Become very present and aware of how you... Find a way to be able to let your body settle very comfortably on the chair that you're in. Take note of your feet on the earth. And if it's comfortable and available to you, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. If it's not and it feels too uncomfortable, then simply let your gaze go to a 45 degree angle and soften your focus. Using my voice as your anchor, I'm going to invite you to check in right now about the quality of your breath. If one is not very and five is a lot, is the quality of your breath right now calm and relaxed? One being not very and five being very much. Try to take notice of where your breath actually is in the physical body experience. Are you breathing in through your nose or your mouth right now? Do you have any awareness of your breath going through your nostrils, into your throat, and into your lungs, maybe all the way down to your belly? Don't try to change anything. Simply become present. Pay attention. Be on purpose. Allowing things to settle and leaving your business and your busyness at the door, this is a pocket to pause. This is called a mindful moment to simply arrive. 
any time your mind might start to whir with too much noise, too many deadlines, or maybe the noise of the news, you can settle. Put your feet on the earth and check in with your breath. You needn't be sitting for a long time, and now you can wiggle your fingers and open your eyes, and kind of come back into the space and have everyone see one another's, and we're back again. It's a really interesting thing that in the midst of the mayhem that's happening right now, I shared with you at the beginning of this, that it turns out that mindfulness is actually one of the best skills. When Dan and I connected, I said, who knew that me having a panic attack and who knew that this experience we're all un uh, undergoing right now is something that would offer us an opportunity to have an enforced pause. You all literally just took an intentional pause, created a pocket right now, and I'm thrilled that everybody um, enjoyed having that mindful moment. Thank you. But here's the curious thing that most of you aren't aware of. I'm going to actually invite you to put your hand up like this where you can see your elbow and put your hand up like this. Touch the end of your elbow a moment. This, my friends, is the adrenal glands that sit at the very back of your body, right above, they're like walnuts, your kidneys. This, run your finger up and down here, is actually your spinal cord. Now I'm going to have you fold your thumb into your hand, and this is going to be what is called the amygdala. The amygdala is way back here, and it is an old part of what is called the reptilian part of the brain, and that is the part of the brain that when you're about to have someone come up behind you on a dark night, your hairs on your neck go up. It's also what we've got wired into our human physiology that saves us if we can feel the sensation of a tiger in our midst. And now I'm gonna curl the front of your fingers over like this. And as you look at my head, right here is called the prefrontal cortex. This is the mammalian, most evolved part of your brain that is actually where all your executive, red, rational, logical thought, like writing marketing copy, or deciding how many Facebook ads to A-B test, or deciding what your customer actually wants to hear happens. But now I want you to actually take your fingers and flip your lid. That is what happens when you are like the guy in the car that was pissed because he was in Miami traffic. And when you flip your lid like that, what occurs is all of the red blood cells and all of the oxygen go back down your body and into all of your organs and send you into what is called fight, flight, or freeze. You are no longer thinking rationally because you're offline. And no one tells us this. No one has handed us a little manual that has said, this is being human 101. Did you have any idea that when you drive through Miami traffic and someone cuts you off, which is a very common experience, you actually flip your lid. So what we're going to talk about today is the case for why mindfulness matters for being human and then why mindfulness matters for marketing. So what I just shared with you is what occurs and is occurring to all of us right now. Most of us may not be aware we are actually in a state of high anxiety. How many of us on that scale of one to 10 with one not being very much five being a lot, throw it in the chat. Are you a one at your level of anxiety right now or are you all the way up at a five? And by the way, there's nothing gonna be shared. It doesn't matter, you know, it's all okay. Um, share in there what your number is. Are you at a one? We've got some people at a three. Are you, some people at a four, some people at a two, some people at a 15, I love it. It is what it is. And here's the most interesting thing to realize is that I'm going to give you a little tip. While we may not have experienced COVID-19 before in our lifetimes, we've been here before. I have a father who was a World War II vet who actually served in Pearl Harbor. He's no longer here. He's passed away. 
but he's one of the ancestors, one of the people who in my heritage was a survivor. We've got people on this call who have come from foreign countries and worked their way to get here. We've got immigrants on this call who have come because they've had nothing and they've made it through. And we collectively, most of us, how many of you remember where you were on 9-11? We all do. We have the capacity to thrive even if we might feel like we're in a moment of only surviving. And because the news is noisy, and the news, by the way, feeds your amygdala, go back to that little thing again, the news is feeding your fear factor. It's not feeding your rationality or your logic or your executive function. So take note now, here's a little test, Next time you listen to the news, before you turn it on, become intentional, asking yourself, am I not very stressed out? I'm at a one. Am I very stressed out at a five? And after you're done engaging in the news, drop in and ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? Has, has my engagement with the news gone from a one all the way up to a five? Because until we build enough self-awareness, which is what mindfulness helps us do, around what our experience is, we won't actually have the ability to be able to shift it. So I'm noting that some folks are sharing with us that your breath feels kind of intermittent. And again, you know what? That's part of being in a state of heightened anxiety. When I invited you to check about the quality of your breath, was it up here in your chest? Was it a little bit lower in the lungs? Or if you were able to put your hand on your belly, are you able to breathe all the way through the belly? Babies breathe through the belly and babies are getting their full oxygen. I'll share with you something really interesting of a friend of mine who's both a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, and a mindfulness teacher. He's actually teaching patients who are experiencing COVID-19 without going into the hospital how to do deep belly breathing to keep the oxygen moving through the body. So I'm gonna share with you in that regard why it is that I do, because Dan and I really chewed through, how do we talk about why mindfulness matters to marketing so much? So this is a really important thing right here at the halfway point for us to pivot to this immediately. First and foremost, if you already know you flipped your lid and you're sitting in front of your computer and you're going, I don't know how I'm gonna spend my money on marketing on Facebook. I don't know how I'm gonna let this many people go. And if you're in that stage of rumination, then you literally don't have any fresh, fresh oxygen coming into the front of your prefrontal cortex to offer you the opportunity to think clearly. So if all you do, and I promise this to Dan, is learn the anti-anxiety breath on this call, then it will have been worth your time. So I'm going to invite you once again to take a dignified seat. Whenever you do that, you let your shoulders come back a little bit, you lift the rib cage, you have a strong back and a soft, gentle front. You're being very present to this moment. You're also remembering again, you didn't have a lot of oxygen going up your spinal cord when you're in a fight, flight, freeze moment. When you offer your body the right posture, you get more oxygen into the front. And now I'm going to invite you to gently close your eyes. And before I teach you the breath, I'm going to ask you to taste and touch with your eyes closed right now something that's at about a midpoint level of anxiety for you. Maybe it's just a deadline on a press release that you have to offer at work. This doesn't have to be something as noisy as what the count is today. Do something that's in the middle level. And I want you to take note where in the body. Is it in your shoulders that you might feel the tightness? Is it in your belly? Maybe you feel it in your hands. Some people's hands cramp up when they get particularly tense. Try to identify where in the body you have the sensations of anxiety. Learn to simply be with it here together. It's not going to do anything to harm you. We are together. You're okay. There's no saber-toothed tigers in the room right now. And now I'm going to invite you to walk through with me the 618 anti-anxiety breath. We will start by breathing in through the nose for a count of six. 
we will let it circulate for a count of one, and we will make our lips like a straw pushing out through the mouth for a count of eight. I'll guide you through this three times. Breathing in through the nose for a count of six. Let it circulate in the lungs, the front of the brain, the body for one. And now push out like a straw through the mouth with a slow, steady breath of an exhale. Turn and breathe in through the nose again. Let it circulate for one. Purse the lips like a straw, pushing out again to a count of eight. Do the turn, coming back in through the nose. Let it circulate through the front of the body, in the brain, pushing out like a straw. Let the breath return to a regular pattern. Now ask yourself, that same experience we started with on a scale of one to five, has it calmed at all? If it was a three, did it drop to a two? If it was a five, has it come down to a four? Maybe it's the same. There are no wrong answers. Wiggle your fingers and now open your eyes and come on back into the space together. What we just learned is basically something with no side effects of how to put your brain back online. And it, essentially what anxiety is doing to all of us right now is we try to work through our marketing pivots or how do we adjust our budgets is we are literally trying to make decisions under duress. And because we don't necessarily know We've got some folks say, my upper chest feels it, or it's in my jaw. All of that, again, is really normal. And it's expected. And it's okay for you to feel this way. What's really allowed, and I love it, I love it, Axel, he says, I feel better. Yes, and Wendy, you went from a five to a three. Um, you just learned a little gem that for me, it took me panic attacks going to an emergency room to have a doctor, a medical doctor, tell me to put my tush on a cush and learn how to slow my roll. I still, as Dan shared at the top of the, the call here, I still do work in the space of marketing. And I happen to work in things that are quite often crisis communications. They might have been, for many of you, um, who might have been familiar with the situation in Venezuela when Chavez was still the president. Here in Miami, the consulate got closed and Venezuelans of many were my friends were not allowed to cast their vote in Miami. And so I and a bunch of friends put together a half of a million dollar raise to charter 10 planes and send Venezuelan based um, residents who lived in Miami to New Orleans and be able to cast their vote. My way of navigating through that was literally knowing how to take a mindful moment. It's not about sitting on a cushion. It's not about necessarily closing your eyes for 20 minutes. It's literally these little types of drop-ins. So what I'd love to do, because I wanna make sure we're really useful and engaged with our time, is I'd love to open this up for kind of our first Q&A and ask any questions anyone might have, and, and if Dan's gonna unmute uh, any of our mics. And I wanna throw in a reminder that as we move through the rest of this second half, I also wanna make sure we talk about what it means to empathize with your customer. So any questions you've got, you've always wanted to ask a mindfulness teacher who happens to be a marketing guru, here I am. I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts or experiences or things that might have arisen for you when we just practiced together. Um, I was just wondering, so how, what's the ideal time for the anti-anxiety breath as far as, um, you know, when you're trying to get through something? So that's a great <clears throat> question. Getting through, it usually takes, so I'm going to give you a little bit of nervous system 101. Our nervous system has two parts. One part that's called sympathetic and one part that's called parasympathetic. Your sympathetic nervous system is actually not got sympathy for you. That's the part of you that when someone says to you, just take a deep breath, take a deep breath, all you're doing is actually activating your heart rate. 
the reason that you do the anti-anxiety breath for two long counts, longer than your in-breath, is because your parasympathetic, which is where your rest and digest lives, helps you come down like a parachute. That cycle you learned of 618, some people, if you practice it enough before the shit hits the fan, you can do it, I can now, in about three breaths, sometimes about five. If you have not practiced it and you use it first as a band-aid in the middle of a difficulty, it's going to take you somewhere between five to ten breaths. And here's the trick. If you practice before you need it, your muscle memory, just like a good sports athlete, is going to have a lot easier drop in, Samuel, because this idea of me even saying, take a dignified seat, all of your body is going to be like, oh, this is a moment for me to actually calm down and, and receive oxygen and be okay. So ideally with practice, you can do it in three to five breaths. Once you start to practice a little bit, but the first couple of times, give yourself anywhere between seven and 10 breaths. So literally that's about a minute, about a minute and a half. And then all of a sudden you've got a great resource. Yeah. Thank you. You know, what, one thing I found um, is that uh, I used to meditate more in the morning after I brought my daughter to school, and I found that that time is disrupted now that she's not going to school. And so my, my biggest thing with meditation is to try to find a, a time that you can, can be just yours uh, on a consistent basis. Like any practice, it's the practice, the consistency where the benefits start to come. And um, one thing I really love about the anti-anxiety breath, which I hadn't ever used before, is that seems like the sort of thing, just like whenever you just start to feel your, your meltdown coming, uh, or maybe you're like right before you're about to do a task that gives you a lot of stress, um, maybe just do that and then kind of try to come into the task refreshed. Um, Mario Coriel asked, would you use a similar technique to prep pre a major business meeting or sales call, Suzanne? So I, I think that, that, and this is the interesting thing, what I'm sharing with all of you today is I'm kind of offering you some tastes of what's on the menu of mindfulness. So you just learned the anti-anxiety breath. The next practice we're going to do is going to be pause, breathe, smile. And I, I love it because Dan's actually from PBS originally, and I don't mean public broadcasting systems. And you can tell I love acronyms because I'm this crazy Virgo who remembers things better if it's an acronym. Um, Yes, definitely use it before a call. And one of the most important things that's really um, necessary is that when you start to figure out what works for you, like Dan realized, I can't do it now that my daughter's home and in the morning, and that actually brings me more stress. Listen to your body, because your issues are in your tissues and your body won't lie. And if your body feels like maybe doing it a few moments before bed or taking a moment after you've had a really, my, my day is really good in the morning. I'm very, very focused and committed. And then after I do lunch is usually when I give myself a short window of practice, five or 10 minutes to sort of settle myself. And I'd love to answer one of the questions that Abdul just brought up because I think it's a really interesting thing. The idea of mindfulness in today's society. Um, and then we'll move to pause, breathe, smile. Um, everyone from the World Economic Forum attendees this year at Davos, to Oprah Winfrey, to Will Smith, to Ariana Huffington, to the owner of BlackRock Ventures, just the list goes on and on of the people who are practicing now, including Bill Gates. So is the world ready for it? I do believe it's innovative and cutting edge. And I also believe that people are figuring out it's a real tool for performance and helping you manage the storm of what's today. Great. So Suzanne, we do have a few more minutes to take questions and there's some really good ones here. Um, Bulgari Commercial Mexico asked, is it recommended to do uh, it daily at the same time as a routine? It's in really, if you go back to the little video that I shared, that Dan shared from Dan Harris, and you look at what he said about mindfulness becoming like brushing your teeth and taking your vitamins, the answer to that is yes. Because when we as humans create ritual, we come to expect it. And when we actually practice mindfulness, it's like giving yourself some mental hygiene. And once you actually do more than what we're doing here, which are just simple drop-in practices, 
you will learn that you're not actually intending to try to not think because newsflash, by the way, people, you have 70,000 thoughts a day. You need to have a pretty long practice to learn how to let all those thoughts not capture your attention. What mindfulness helps you do, as Dan shared at the beginning, is it actually helps you be aware of the content of what's going on in your physical and mental experience and not get carried away by it, like the guy in the car getting pissed. You know, Jill and M Maria Daniela both asked sort of a similar question, which kind of at its core relates to like, how do I incorporate mindfulness and still stay true to who I am? Jill asked, my question is, I'm a high anxiety, high energy marketer, um, but everyone on my team is the opposite. How do I keep my energy level up to help motivate them while staying level and not showing them how anxious I am? And that's so, a really generous question. Beautiful question from someone who I will tell you is an adrenaline addict. <laughs> I literally lived on adrenaline most of my career from launching TV products in 47 countries to, you know, doing the work for Gates in Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. I ran on adrenaline. What I found out is that by letting myself settle, it doesn't take away my edge. But what it does do is it expands my resources to be able to last longer through the things that become challenging. So it literally is a way of me not necessarily thinking that I have to always be on and I have to always be high because I will share with you that is a formula for burnout. Our society believes that always on and autopilot is actually beneficial. And it's an amazing way to eventually burn out your nervous system. I can share with you what happened to me is my circadian rhythms, which means normally at night you go to sleep and normally during the day you wake up, got flip-flopped. And I literally had the opposite. I was awake at the daytime and asleep. I'm sorry, I was awake at the nighttime and I was asleep at the daytime because my cortisol had gotten flipped upside down. So there is a danger to burnout. And learning how to manage your energy and how you motivate yourself is the key. Carmen Baker has her hand up. Thanks, Carmen. I can see you're getting uh, experience with Zoom. Uh, feel free to ask your question. My question is, when, what, is what is a gentle or a persuasive way uh, to get somebody to try this, you know, some of my clients are very, very highly, highly strong, as you can imagine. And I have recommended this as a practice. And there still are those skeptics that they're like, oh, you know, I don't have time for that, uh, which my take is burnout. You know, you need to make the time for that. So what would you recommend as a gentle nudge, you know, to get somebody to try this? So I'll share with you and thank you, by the way, because that means you, first of all, got awareness of what's going on with them, Carmen. You're probably catching that they're pretty high anxiety. <laughs> and what I would share with you is one of the most important things you can do is model it. When Dan and I were having our conversations about doing the talk today, and I often do this, is people will say, well, you know, we're going to talk about this and this and this and this. And I'm like, and we're going to practice. I'm not going to just get on a call and talk to you as a mindfulness expert. I'm going to have you taste it. And by the time you're done in a 60-minute call, I'm going to make sure you actually have three times that you will have tasted it. So my recommendation to you, Carmen, is this. You could simply say to people, especially with Zoom being the way we're all connecting now, you could say, listen, I'm on Zoom calls back to back to back. What I like to do at the top of my Zoom call is for 60 seconds as everybody comes in, just have a mindful moment of silence so that everybody can come into the call and collect their thoughts before we start our engagement. And that way, you are setting the example you are being the change as Gandhi invited us to be. And you are literally saying, this is really good for me. I find it to be really helpful for me to shift from a conversation with BizHack to now a conversation with a client. And this is helpful for me to make that transition. In the television business or in the radio business, this would be known as a segue. And we as humans kind of need a segue to go from one thing to the next. 
So it's a little bit of marketing about how to insert a mindful moment into how you conduct your engagements with those clients. Thank you. Very, That's very cool. nice. Thank you. You know, and that relates really well to Maria Daniela's question, which is what is the best way to practice mindfulness when you're in a tough meeting or having a difficult conversation? How do you disconnect without disconnecting at all of the situation? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys exactly the practice that is gorgeously perfect for right now that I told Dan we would also offer, which is the pause, breathe, smile. And you don't have to close your eyes for it. And you can be standing in the public's line with six feet of distance between you and the person in front of you. And it's the 10 items or less line, but they have 22. So I'm going to ask you to do what we've done. Take a dignified seat. I just painted to you kind of that scenario. Close your eyes if that's available to you. And for a moment, imagine yourself in the line. There's six feet in front of you. You have nine items. They've got 22 because you're standing there and counting them because you're nervous and you're anxious and you want to get in and you want to get out. And you've got your mask on. Take note and check in. Where in your body are you feeling this anxiety? Is it the tummy? Is it your shoulder? Where do you feel it? And right now you're going to do the first part of the practice, which is simply pause. And you're going to be aware, oh, there's that little jangle I get in the back of my neck. Huh, that's where I get stressed when my boss calls me to tell me I'm late on a deadline. Interesting. You've paused. Now I'm going to invite you simply to take an in-breath through your nose. I'm breathing in and I know that I'm breathing in. Breathe out and know that you're breathing out. Do the same thing again. Breathe in. I know that I'm breathing in. Breathe out. I know that I'm breathing out. And the last time. Breathe in and breathe out. Now smile. And in this moment of awareness, check in and see if that angst or that anxiety has calmed it all from the beginning and open your eyes and smile and come back into the room. I'll tell you the technology and the body behind what we just did. Pausing gives you space. When you have space, you have more than just one opportunity to respond. When you breathe, we already know, instead of being in fight, flight, or freeze, you just brought your brain back online. And when you smile, you actually send a signal to your nervous system that even if you're pissed, your nervous system kind of goes, wait a minute, she's smiling. Everything must be okay. So you actually override your nervous system. So in that meeting, to circle back to that question, if you're in that moment, you don't have to close your eyes. All you need to do is become aware of, oh, I can feel that sensation. Oh, I can feel that, oh man, here goes my boss. She's gonna go on that rant. Be aware. Okay, I've felt this before. Let me pause. Let me breathe. And let me just gently smile. Because you literally can allow yourself, and I'll give you another little news flash, folks. Anybody have any idea, throw it in the chat. How long do you think an emotion actually runs through your body? Do you think an emotion is three minutes? Do you think an emotion is 10 seconds? What's the process of how long do you think an emotion actually has as a course through our body? Five yes, seconds. 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 Seconds, so yes. You actually have 90 seconds for an emotion if you don't feed it to show up. I'm pissed. And if you learn to just go, oh, here's pissed, here's anger. Wow, look at that. If you're able to wear it out, you basically have 90 seconds. So you've now learned anti-anxiety breath. You've learned the pause, breathe, smile, and I wanna be very mindful of time because Dan has wanted us to be very um, diligent with how we're staying in touch. The thing I wanna share with you really quickly about why all of this matters to why it will help you empathize with your customer is because guys, guess what? Anybody who either is engaging you to do the work that you do for them, whether you are a consultant, whether you are their ad agency, 
whether they are actually hiring you for a product, a good, or a service, they're feeling the same things right now that you are because we're all having human experiences. So all of a sudden, if you're aware that you're nervous about making a call to go collect an invoice, one of the first things you can do is do what I did at the beginning of this, which is normalize the experience. I'll tell you my happiest takeaway of what I'm watching happen in the business world right now. I'm noting that at the top of every call I have, besides me starting with a mindful moment, everyone I talk to is asking about the well-being and welfare of one another. And here is what I believe is happening in business right now. We are now starting to shift the human role of only being here for productivity and return on investment to now actually be at the same level, our well-being and how we are as the humans who make work work are now actually being included in that equation. I think it's a challenge since the industrial revolution that has been a long time in coming. We are actually showing up as humans and being human at work works. So Dan, I just wanna thank you. I wanna be sure we're mindful of time. If you wanna manage any more q and I'm here, but I just wanna thank you all for the fact that you did something different and you actually even created some new neural networks today by listening to what I'm sharing. You actually impact the neuroplasticity of your brain for good by coming to do something you've not done before.